Hi, I'm Will from Testin. I'm Norm from Testin. Norm, this is the Kindle Fire 8.9 HD. It is Amazon's large size tablet, the follow up to their seven inch version, which they released earlier this year. It's not a 10 inch tablet like the iPad or the all the other Android tablets. It's not a seven inch tablet. It's 8.9 inches diagonally screen. Let's see, it's like a pound and a quarter. So that means it weighs a little less than an iPad 3 or 4, which is noticeable, mm -hmm. but significantly more than a Nexus 7 or an iPad Mini. Any of the 7 inch tablets. It's right also 8.8 .8 millimeters thick, which means about the same thickness as the iPad 3, mm -hmm. but actually thinner than the 7 inch Kindle just, Fire it's HD. Just the tiniest, tiniest bit. Uh, I mean, in reality, you're not going to notice that kind of thickness difference in your hands. And it's perfectly holdable as a two hand tablet. Inside, there's also one gigabyte of RAM and a Texas Instruments OMAP processor. That's a clocked up version, a newer rev than what you'd find in the seven inch tablet. Yeah, it's 300 mega megahertz faster than the one in the seven inch tablet in the seven inch Kindle Fire. Um, but that's mainly accounted for, that and the additional RAM are accounted for by the increased resolution of the screen. And the screen is an 8.9, 1920 by 1200 pixel resolution screen, uh, which is not as high pixel density as an iPad 3 or 4, or even the Nexus 10 with the crazy 2560 by 1600 resolution. But for everything you're going to do on the Kindle Fire HD, perfectly fine. Uh, yeah, in fact, actually, I would not I would say that you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between this and an iPad screen if you're just coming up and looking at photos and watching video on it. Um, it's a 16 by 10 aspect ratio screen, so 16 parts wide by 10 parts high. And that's interesting because it lets you display, since it's 1920 by 1200, you can actually display 1080p video at native resolution on this screen. So given the 1920 by 1200 resolution screen, the thing that Amazon wants you to do most is rent, buy, or watch video. So watching video on this device, regardless of the source, is great. Uh, the screen's big, the colors are really vibrant, it has its speakers on the back that are placed in a way that you can actually hear them. They're stereo. They're not amazing speakers. You're not going to fill a room with this sound. But if you want to watch a YouTube video and not have to plug in headphones to hear, perfect for that. Uh, the video source, though, even though the screen is 1920 by 1200, we couldn't tell whether the Amazon Prime Instant Streaming Video was actually delivering 1080p video. And for all your testing, really the only way to guarantee you get 1080p video is to rip a Blu-ray and upload it. Yeah, a couple of vendors will do 1080p streaming, um, but for the most part, it's 720p on the web, including most of what Amazon offers. Uh, Amazon does also offer X-Ray. So for videos you purchase or download or rent or whatever from Amazon, you can see into the video, which usually means you can see which actors are on screen at any given time and click into their IMD BIOS. It's not that useful a feature. Yeah, it's IMDB because Amazon owns IMDB. So you can find a list of all the actors in a certain scene. Of course, there's a ton of other places on the web that you might want to watch video. Netflix, HBO Go, um, Hulu show, Plus. Hulu Plus. They're, they're all over the place. Because you have access to Android style apps on the Kindle Fire from the Amazon App Store, you can download a lot of that stuff. Uh, some of the music selections are a little bit limited, but Pandora, like I said, Hulu Plus, HBO Go, all that stuff's there. Netflix is hooked up to it. So you can see those sources as well. Surprisingly, for an Amazon Kindle device, reading is not so hot on the Kindle HD. Yeah, it's, there's nothing fundamentally wrong, but it's just not as good as the other Kindle devices. If you look into the actual books, when you open them up, if you're holding the landscape position, which seems to be the more comfortable way to hold the Kindle Fire 8.9 HD, uh, it, it has a two column view. And which, you can't change that. Um, I, you know, whether you can or not, if you did, the, the lines would be crazy long and it would be even harder to read. Uh, when you rotate into portrait view, then you have just a giant page of text. So it's too much text one way, too many columns the other. It's non-optimal. Although I have to say they did a great job of tuning the brightness now. So you can actually turn the brightness on the Kindle Fire, on the new Kindle Fire HDs down far enough to use this when you're laying in bed without making an eye blaster out of the tablet. Of course, if you're invested in another ebook store like Barnes & Noble's Nook or iBooks, unfortunately, you can't actually read those on the Kindle Fire with the native apps. At least not without using Calibri or something like that to strip out the DRM. Web browsing on tablets. It's the thing I do most on a tablet, and unfortunately on the Kindle Fire HD, it's only so-so. Yeah, the, the Silk browser, which is Amazon's version of a, of a browser, it does a little bit of rendering offline in the cloud, or online in the cloud, and a little bit of rendering on the device locally. Um, it's, it's okay. It's, uh, it renders pages fine, but the problem is that the stuff that surrounds it is actually not as good as Chrome and Safari on their respective platforms. We've come a long way in mobile browsers where on Safari, on mobile Chrome, we have features like tab syncing, browser syncing, accounts, and that stuff is very limited on Silk. 
Yeah, uh, I, I love that feature in Chrome where you can send a page from your desktop browser to the tablet because it lets you treat this as an extension of your desktop, which is the most exciting part about tablets. Uh, that stuff isn't available in Silk yet, and who knows if it ever will be. And something we also noticed while using web browser is that the keyboard is not great on the Kindle Fire I, either. I, not great is uh, really being kind. It is an actual bad keyboard. It lags at inappropriate times. So you don't get feedback on what you're typing. And sometimes you'll type a whole word, maybe two, uh, while the keyboard rushes to catch up. And also the predictive text on the keyboard is a little too helpful. It'll actually correct words that you did not intend to change. That is exactly right. To watch video, to read books, and to browse the web, you can do that for about eight hours of battery. Yeah, uh, battery life was quite good. Uh, video viewing obviously was the bigger drag. Uh, if you could browse the web on Wi-Fi for as long as you'd ever want to use this thing. Um, the uh, standby time, if you're not using it so much, seems to be on the order of one to two weeks. Uh, I used it heavily for the first few days, charged it twice in that period, uh, then put it in my bag and let it kind of age, and got down to 15 or 16% over a nine or 10 day window. So uh, it's entirely what I would expect from a tablet this size in terms of battery life. It's good that you don't have to charge it very often because they also do not include a wall wart. All you get is a micro USB key to plug it in, and it takes a long time for just plugging into a computer. Yeah, so uh, when you're plugging in with a with a with just a normal 500 milliamp USB port, it can take 14, 12 to 14 hours to charge fully, which is crazy. If you're using a lower power USB brick, then you can charge in overnight, say eight to 10 hours. That's what I, I got with my white Kindle charger, the old one. Um, the power charger supposedly would charge the entire tablet in four hours. It costs 10 bucks. Uh, I'm fine being nickel and dimed on stuff like that on a $300 tablet, which is what the 16 gig model that I'm holding right here is. On the higher end, 16, uh, 64 gig models, it costs six or $700. I would be a little bit upset if they didn't include a power brick. So there are quite a few things about the Kindle Fire HD that frankly are kind of annoying. Yeah, it's still not a perfect, perfectly designed tablet. For example, the home button in landscape mode is on the right side of the screen. In portrait mode, it's on the left side of the screen. I understand why you would make that choice, but it's really confusing when you just, all you want to do is find the home button. It's things like the power button are a little bit too easy to hit and alternately hard to find. I don't know exactly how that's possible, but I hit it by accident when I pick it up with my right hand all the time, and when I want to find it to turn it on, I can't because there's no obvious up and down on this device. The only point of reference you have on the front bezel is the camera, which is on the top of the landscape bezel. I also found multitasking to be really limited on this device. Uh, while things like the browser will save state and the tabs you have open and all that sort of thing, uh, apps rarely save state. So Facebook, whenever you open the Facebook app, it just goes to the top of your feed. Um, when you open a game, it relaunches the game. There's no easy way in the carousel that I can find that will let you switch back into an app in the state that it was running before. Now, the Kindle Fire also starts at $300 for, with special offers, so mm -hmm. there are offers on this device. But when you're paying for the maxed out model, it's a little unfair that you have to pay 15 bucks. I feel like on a $600 tablet, you shouldn't have to pay 15. You shouldn't get nickeled and dined on a $600 tablet. It's a premium item. So for the $300, you only get 16 gigs of storage with the Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. uh, if you add $70, that doubles the 32 gigs, and yep. then you can add more money to get 4G LTE. Yeah, uh, the 4G LTE models only start at 32 gigabytes and go to 64 gigabytes. And I think that's $500 for the 32 gigabyte and 600 for the for the 64 gigabyte model. Um, and then of course you have to add your 10 bucks for the power brick and 15 bucks to turn off special offers if you're into that whole thing. Um, the LG, LTE is provided by AT&T, which you know, they have a relatively, they're still in rollout, so they have 40 or 50 cities uh, activated now. The interesting thing about that is the deal. It's 50 bucks a year, that's right, a year, for 250 megabytes of data transfer across AT&T's network a month, which is a pretty good deal uh, if only for checking email and maybe web browsing and checking maps when you're out and about. And the Kindle will actually block you from streaming video from the store yeah. or downloading large apps so you don't use up that 250 megs. Anything that's going to hit the bandwidth hard, it says you can't You can't do that. We bought the Wi-Fi only version just because I don't see any reason to spend money on AT&T's LTE network right now. Um, if, if you feel like $50 a year isn't much and are willing to pay $200 more for the tablet, then go nuts. Still at $300 for the cheapest model, we feel like the seven inch Kindle Fire HD, which is only $200, is a better value. The 8.9 inch tablet is great for video watching. It's okay for web browsing, and it's kind of a so-so ebook reader. Uh, for that reason, unless you really, really want a great big video player, I gotta say pass on the 8.9 and get one of the many different seven inch tablets or just a paper e-ink reader or something like that if you're looking to read books. 
Uh, and that'll do it for the Kindle Fire 8.9 HD for Test Time Will. I'm Norm. See you guys later. Bye.